well it's officially spring now. Uh, we've just tipped over into September and um, today it's been it's putting on a really nice spring-like day. It's a lot warmer, a lot of birds chirping um, and in theory it's going to be clear till about midnight tonight. It's the forecasts have said for the last two or three days that it's going to be clear overnight and unfortunately what's happened is the clouds have tended to roll in as the sun sets, although I have had some opportunity to do a bit of imaging in between sets of clouds rolling through. So I'm hoping at least tonight to get a, a few hours um, imaging time with the Esprit 120 and uh, my target for tonight is the Helix Nebula. Um, now that's about 650 light years from Earth, it's one of the closest planetary nebulas to, to Earth and sadly it's a result of a, a dying star. So in the centre there is a star which is shedding out its um, outer shell of gases. Um, that star is, is destined to become a white dwarf and um, the sort of radiation from it uh, coming out from the star is actually causing the, the shell of nebulosity that's shed out to glow which is why we get this um, quite amazing look of an eye um, staring down at us from space. Uh, it's also known as the Eye of God or the Eye of Sauron from, from Lord of the Rings. Um, last year I shot it with the 10 inch Mead and I was only really able to get into the really centre part of it. I couldn't get the whole um, nebula into my field of view. So, um, But it did show the nice commentary bodies, commentary bodies. Um, coming out from from the centre, and I'm hoping this will this will show them as well. But I've got a much wider field of view, so this time I'm hoping to pick up um, all uh, or as much as I can of the nebulosity around the outside. Now there's some very very faint parts to this nebula which don't often show up in a lot of images, and I'm not sure how long I'm going to have to expose for to try and pick those up. So I'm going to try 10 and 20 minute exposures. Um, I might try for the first time doing a 30 minute exposure, I've never gone that long before, but just to see whether I can pick up a bit more detail um, of that sort of outer um, bit of hydrogen. So um, yeah, ideally I would like to have a bit more time on this, but um, we'll get what we can tonight and um, here's hoping the clouds don't roll in as soon as they think they're going to be rolling in. So if we quickly um, have a look at Stellarium, uh, this is where the Helix Nebula is uh, going to be situated. Um, so it's sort of out towards the east around the time it's starting to get dark. I can probably start imaging somewhere between 7 and 7.30. Now the Helix Nebula is situated in the constellation of Aquarius here. And um, I'm just going to zoom in and this is the Helix Nebula that you can see why it's called the Eye of God or the Eye of Sauron. Very much looks like an eye with uh, um, the iris and the pupil in, in the middle. Um, and there's this bit here which uh, to me sort of looks like the eyebrow, um, although it's upside down for us down here. Now in the centre is a star which is actually near the end of its uh, evolution. Um, sort of destined to become a white dwarf and um, it is shedding its outer layers um, as it sort of is coming, coming to the end of its, its days and um, we have this nice look of the more O3 rich um, centre in the middle here and then the hydrogen alpha rich surrounding um, layers out here. Um, now I'm hoping to be able to pick up more than just what is visible here. This is quite sort of typical of an image of the helix, seeing um, this area here and this sort of, as I said, eyebrow bit. But there are other parts to this nebula which are a lot more faint. Um, and I'm trying to remember which way around it is. I think there's a lot more sort of up here, more sort of billowing look, looking cloud up here. And then there's a funny triangular shaped area, um, either this end or this end, I'm not sure which. Um, hopefully I'll find those in the images. But that's what I would also like to try and pick up, um, get some of that more f uh, faint nebulosity with this target. Uh, hence why I'm going to experiment with all the different um, length images, whether it be um, 10 minutes, 20 minutes or 30 minutes and just see what gives me the best um, detail for the time. 
because obviously if you're doing 10 minute exposures and something goes wrong we've just lost a 10 minute exposure but if you're doing 30 minute exposures and something goes wrong in about 28 minutes um, then um, that's a lot of time lost so I'll have to be be careful about balancing the amount of detail I'm getting with the time for each exposure so yeah as I said start somewhere between 7 and 7.30 and um, go as long as I can. So Nina's been running for a while collecting some images. Um, you can see the eyebrow part at least is quite clear. There is cloud um, or nebulosity up there and then there's this very faint stuff down here which is sort of funny triangular shape but which I'm hoping will be a bit more obvious once I stack all the, the images. I'm collecting 15 minute exposures. Um, and uh, guiding is going really, really nicely tonight with a very low total error, I think about um, 0.4, roughly around that. Um, star counts are starting to drop now because the target has passed overhead and is heading now down towards the horizon. The HFR has been reasonably stable, so I'm, I'm happy about that. Um, the 15 minute exposures seem to be the best compromise I found. I did 10 minute, 15, 20 and 30 minute exposures. The 15 did seem to have more detail than the 10 minute ones but the 20 and 30 minute exposures didn't seem to have a lot more than I was getting with 15 minutes so I decided it was probably safest just to stick around 15 minutes and um, yeah hopefully I've got a lot more of that faint nebulosity that I was after once I um, stack all these images up. Okay so we're in Pixon's site and I've got my stacked um, HA information here and the O3 here. This one's actually stretched um, and I just um, clip forward through the steps. I actually manually stretch this. Now you could stop it about here which I think um, would be fairly reasonable to do. You've certainly got uh, plenty of the Helix Nebula here, plenty of the so-called eyebrow and you've even got some of this um, detail up here there's a bit of extra um, HA signal down here and there's a very faint um, look to this sort of pointy area down here. Um, I did actually um, stretch it further which to this point does look a bit blown out the stars have got a bit bloaty um, and but it really has pulled this area out a lot more and also you can see this um, sort of pointed area a bit more prominence and there's a bit more of extension out here of the HA. Um, a couple more adjustments with curves just to sort of darken things up a bit and um, so that's the HA. This is the O3 which um, came out so I sort of first stretched it to this point then I did a range mask and just pushed this um, a little bit brighter um, since I didn't have anywhere near as much time spent on the O3 as I did on the HA. Now you can see here that this is actually going to compete um, well this is actually going to compete quite a lot with a signal and if I just combine them like this you'd end up with this area in the middle looking pretty white and washed out which I didn't want. I wanted this area to this O3 to dominate as it, as it should in that area. So how was I going to darken this area down here? Well I found that the um, HDR uh, multi-scale transform tool worked really well. I had it on a layer setting of 6 and you tick the lightness and lightness mask boxes and if I just click forward here when that was applied you can see that's nicely dark in the central area here and also increase some of the um, detail uh, of the cometary bodies um, here so that worked really quite nicely um, and then I basically uh, did a combination combine them together in the LRGB combination um, tool as um, I put hydrogen to red and oxygen to um, green and blue and ended up with uh, an image that looked like this. Um, I actually then applied um, HDR to this again. Um, I don't know if I use six or seven, we'll just throw six on here just to have a look, like layers of six, let it throw, run through and um, actually gave a much nicer colour in the centre here, that more sort of turquoisey colour that I would expect and also um, gave a bit more detail um, in this area here. And then I used the game script to give myself a, uh, a mask that looks like this. So the game script allows you to do a customised shape to your mask. 
put that um, onto this um, image here and just then stretch that bit a, a little bit further just to brighten up these areas. Now it was still a very deep red sort of blood looking red that I didn't really want. I wanted more of this sort of orangey red look. Um, and so what I decided with that was to use and go under script utilities and use the um, correct magenta stars tool. Now this is primarily used for correcting your stars that look a bit purple but I thought in this instance I would just apply it to the whole image and um, see what effect I got with it adjusting some of the red colour um, here and also in the stars. Now I don't think I ran it at about 80, I think it was more like between 60 and 70. We'll just um, put it at 65 for the purposes of this video and hit execute and you can see it inverts it and um, then takes out, uh, basically applies an SNR degreen because when you invert this, I'll just close this. So we can see here it's a much more sort of an orangey red colour now. Um, if I just run backwards through those steps, um, you can see here it's inverted, it looks quite blue around the outside. If I click back one more, it's quite green because when it inverts this red or the sort of magenta component and you invert it, it goes sort of more of a greeny colour and then it applies a SNR um, with removing some of the green, um, which then gives you a more blue look and then when you invert it back this is what you end up with and also meant that the stars went from that sort of more blood red to a bit more of a sort of an orangey yellow look which was quite nice with still some bluish stars and white stars and then it was a matter of applying Starnet to this to remove the stars and work on the, the nebula um, part itself um, using um, the uh, come up to here script utilities and the top color mask tool sorry uh, it says something is active and i'm not sure where that is oh i need an actual active window that's right so um we'll just bring this back up here so um utilities and color mask there we go and then pick the colors now obviously it's a bit limited in this image because we've got the cyan sort of in the middle and then we've got either red or um, yellowy um, look through here the colors it would pick up so when I did a mask for the cyan I, I have to cancel that I ended up with um, just this area so it's just obviously picking up the central bit here um, I did have to um, apply curves to dark in the background because there was a lot of other junk being picked up here so I just wanted this bit to be um, uh, picked out and then when you apply this then obviously you get a mask protecting everything apart from that central bit which then you can apply your curves to adjust the color as you see fit and um, if we just remove that mask and then the um, red mask and the yellow mask are very similar so you can see red and yellow now this is what both the red and the yellow looked like when I first created them there's a lot of stuff being picked up in the background and it was a matter of again just applying curves to this to keep this light and dark in this area so this is actually the red where this has been kept nice and bright and the background has been darkened because when I adjust the colors I don't want the background being adjusted as well and again when you apply this you can see the area that we're just going to be working on there to um, get whatever color is required and um, then it was a matter of working once I decided got sort of the color that I wanted it was a matter of um, working on the HA here which if I just step back through here to, this is what I was going to use for my luminance layer so again did a star net to it so I applied star net to it and got a, a, a um, uh, starless version and I'll just step back through here so this is what it looks like with the stars um, applied star net the stars disappear and then I wanted to bring out a lot more detail so again HDR uh, multi transform tool applied it gives me that look and then I also did some local um, histogram equalization this was set at around about, about, I usually set about 150 and then I just bring it down, Not I don't want too much otherwise you can get 
you know it can go crazy if you if you ramp it up really high for example throw that on here um, it can actually look terrible so I'll just show you what that looks like just to, to give you an idea that you really don't want to be sort of overdoing this so that just goes a little bit too wacky um, if we just go backwards what I did was I usually apply have a setting somewhere around about 200 or so a little bit more of a subtle change but it does help give a little bit more contrast between brighter areas and darker areas to bring up some of that um, detail so you can see just a subtle change there if you just go backwards and forwards from there to there and then it was a matter of applying that to my um, uh, color version now the color part the the bit that I worked on with the colors I then uh, did a convolution to blur it out a little bit because I didn't need the detail for there and I wanted to smooth off any of the sort of areas that looked a little bit funny from perhaps when Starnet was applied etc and um, ended up with not that but ended up with this look here um, and then it was a matter of um, putting the stars back in from Starnet and I took it into Photoshop and worked a little bit more on it um, and ended up with the following image.